Hi everyone, my name is Michael Cook. I'm a PhD student at Imperial College London's Computational Creativity Group. And this is some work that I presented at the 2013 International Conference on Computational Creativity. I did it with my PhD supervisor, Simon Colton, and also Jeremy Gao, um, both previously of Imperial College and now working at Goldsmiths. The paper title was Nobody's a Critic, um, and it was some work that we did on creative code generation um, in the context of my PhD work. Um, about Angelina. So my PhD work centred around this question, can you automatically design games? And we were interested in that from all angles, so every aspect of a game. And although it started off from a very functional standpoint, um, over the course of the PhD we moved on to questions of creativity and whether the system could not just uh, create games but have some sort of creative input into the finished product as well. Um, at the conference I talked about how games are kind of the killer app for creativity. Um, they integrate so many different creative domains into a single output. There's music, art, narrative, metaphor, linguistics, um, and a bunch of other creative domains, just about everyone that you can think of really. Um, and the one that we're really interested in is this one at the bottom here, the rules, the mechanics of the game, the things that defines the systems, um, because that's where you get meaning from games, I think. Um, so briefly, we built a system called Mechanic Miner, which you might have heard of before when I was talking about A Puzzling Present, which is a game we released for Android, um, and I'll talk about that later. Mechanic Miner is a system that takes game code and produces mechanics. It also produces levels, but um, we don't have time to discuss that in this talk, and it's not really mentioned in the paper either, but there's a paper in EvoStar, which is also on my website, that describes the level generation part of it too. By game mechanics, um, there are a lot of different definitions for this, but the definition that I, uh, that I use um, in the paper and when talking about the work, especially to people who might not be familiar with um, video games, is that there's some way that the player has of interacting with the game world, either directly or indirectly. So if you look at this picture of Super Mario, um, in Super Mario, if you press the A button, Mario will jump upwards. Um, and this is a direct way for the player to interact with the game systems. So you can uh, you can affect Mario's position on the screen and his velocity and momentum by pressing the A button. Um, if you've played Mario before, you know that when Mario lands on that mushroom there, that mushroom's going to get squished and die. That's an indirect um, mechanic. It's an indirect way for the player to interact with the game systems. So they can kill that uh, mushroom and change Mario's position again by using direct actions to position Mario in a particular way, in this case on top of the mushroom. So in the past we've tried to look at rules and mechanics and game systems and generate them using Angelina. Um, and the first approach we did to this was through our arcade games where we used rule templates that we filled in during the course of the game's design. So a rule template might look like this, so you've got a type and a type and then an effect and effect and a score. And what that meant was when an object of the first type, like player, collides with an object of the second type, like red, then you would apply the first effect to the first object so nothing would happen to the player. Um, the second effect to the second object, so the red object would get killed, and then you would add the score to the, to the global score. Um, and the thing is, that's, that's okay, but it's lacking a lot of... Um, what makes mechanics interesting, and from a creativity perspective, it's it's definitely very uninteresting. Um, we want more generality than this. So if you go back to those rule templates, you'll see that we've got things like kill. That's a very prescriptive um, chunk of information to give to Angelina. It's really telling it a lot of information about the kinds of mechanics that I think it should generate, um, and that's that's not good just generally in terms of how interesting the system is, but it's particularly not good for Angelina because the objective with Angelina is to produce a system that doesn't require human input. Um, it doesn't require humans to write the word kill and to describe what that means functionally. Tied into generality is this question of novelty. So from a creativity perspective, um, it's really important that our systems are producing things which are new or surprising in some way. Um, and that's less likely to happen if we're giving it big puzzle pieces that describe bits of rules. We need to go um, at a higher level to give Angelina more control over the kinds of things it's producing so that it can produce things that we don't expect. And um, although I didn't labour this point at the conference, um, from a game's perspective, I'm really interested in looking at actual game mechanics, direct game mechanics. So before we were really looking at the rules of the game, so what happens when two objects intersect with each other? 
But what I'm interested in is giving the player control of things that they can switch on and off, activate, deactivate, um, and alter in some way, because that's when you get more interesting systems emerging. And I want to include this quote by Anna Anthropy. Um, so she's a game designer and critic. She wrote a book called Rise of the Video Game Zinesters. There's this great definition of a game in there quite early on. And she says, a game is an experience created by rules. And if we accept that to be true, and many of you may not, um, but I really like that definition, then the rules are going to be where we need to go if we want to make games that are really interesting and moving and meaningful um, and surprising. So how do we get generality and novelty and all those other things we just talked about? Well, at their base level, the level that you and I might implement a game mechanic at, game mechanics are code. So here's a bit of code. This says that if the space bar is pressed, then you find the player object, and you access their velocity field and the Y component of their velocity field, and you make it set to a minus value. And what this does in the game library called Flixel is it takes the player object and it moves the player object up in the air like it's jumping. So if game mechanics are code then why haven't we just tried to generate code before? Because we actually have systems in programming languages that let us do this. So here's some Java code. So object O equals new objects. So we make a new version of the object class. Well Java's got a lot of funky features called reflection. Um, and reflection can let you really manipulate code um, as if it were any other kind of data. So you can use it to generate and modify code um, quite naturally, um, although this might not be so natural certainly if you've not programmed before, but here we can actually ask for an object that represents the type of object. And you can take that object and you can ask what fields it has defined in it, for instance. And Java will give you back a list of field objects, and those fields have things like their names or their types. So you can look at a class that you've never seen before, and you will be able to programmatically go inside that class, ask for what variables it has in it, what kind of type of variables are they, what are, they, what are the names of those variables. And you can do a lot more besides, you can do method invocation and generic typing and all sorts of craziness. So mechanics are code, we know how to generate code, why don't we just generate mechanics, right? It sounds fairly easy. In reality it was a nightmare, but here's the very basic steps that we took with Mechanic Miner. Pick a random class within the game code that you've been given. Pick a random variable within that class. And then generate some kind of modifier that's conditional on the field's type. So um, here's an example for you. The, the field that we randomly selected was the player's acceleration uh, vector and the y component of that. So a little bit like the velocity that we saw earlier, but this time the acceleration instead of the velocity. And the modifier that we apply is multiply times minus one. So when you press a button, in the game, it finds that field and it applies the modifier to it. And in actual fact, what this would do is, um, in Flixel, acceleration is how you express gravity on an object typically. So multiplying that value by minus one would flip gravity upside down in a kind of VV, VV, VV style. So that is not particularly directed, right? That, that's just how to generate a mechanic. Um, that mechanic might be completely meaningless. It might just change the color of the text, for instance, because we're just picking random fields and random classes. So how do we pick? How do we decide if a mechanic's good or not? Well, fun's pretty difficult to do, so we, we eliminated that from the running fairly early on. Um, interesting, also relatively subjective, so that's, that's kind of off the menu too. Not sure thoughtful is really there either, um, but I tell you what we can do. We can do functional, we can do useful, um, and you can't spell functional without fun, so I feel like we're on, we're on the right track there. So how do you work out if a mechanic's functional then? Well, here's how mechanic minor works. We take a level that we know we can't solve, so this is a bit of an abstract diagram here, but if you imagine that this is a Super Mario level, and you start at the red dot, and Mario has to get to the blue dot. Um, that big tower in the middle doesn't let Mario get there. Um, in fact, this pink area shows you the area you can access. So you can fall for a bit, and then you can jump up and down, but you can't jump very high. So we can give this to Angelina, and Angelina can actually play out this level and um, tell you that that pink area exists and that it can't reach the exit. Then using our mechanic generation and using Reflection's ability to execute arbitrary code, um, we can add a mechanic, like the one that I showed you a couple of slides ago, to this simulation. And suddenly Angelina has a new button to press when it plays the game. And what this button does in this case is it inverts gravity. 
So one of the solutions it now finds is that if it inverts gravity at the start of the level, it can climb across the ceiling, move all the way to the right, and flip gravity again. The simulation can notice that without this mechanic it couldn't solve the level, and with the mechanic it could solve the level. And as a result it knows that if the only thing that changed is this mechanic, this mechanic must give us some new functionality, some new feature that allows us to do something we couldn't before. And therefore it's a useful mechanic. And that's, that's the core metric um, that's inside Mechanic Miner. It's very black and white, and it's a very um, specialised test case, but it's really effective. And to show you it's effective, here's a couple of examples that we came up with. So <clears throat> I've already shown you the inverting gravity example. That's um, as seen in Terry Cavanaugh's VVVVVV, um, which is a great game. And actually this um, example was the inspiring example that caused us to design Mechanic Miner in the way that we did. So it wasn't particularly surprising to me that it came out. But at the same time, we've, it's, it's a good confirmation that the system's working as intended. So that was nice we had bouncing come out. So one of the mechanics, you could make yourself rubbery. You could turn that on and off. So you would bounce higher and higher with each bounce. Um, and that's not a particularly common mechanic. Um, I've seen it in a few games. The best example is um, Niflis's Night Sky, um, where one of the features is that you can change how elastic you are, basically, and how bouncy you are. Um, but there's also some kind of unexpected results as well. So one of the mechanics it produced was teleportation, which moved Santa a fixed distance to the right. Um, so it would move it 50 pixels to the right, let's say. Um, and while Angelina was testing this mechanic out um, and generating levels that, that use this mechanic, it would produce solutions that didn't make any sense to me. So it would tell me that the way that it got out of this level, for instance, was some sequence of key presses. And I would look at the map and I would say, well, this is impossible. I don't really understand how it's done this. And it took me a good few days to work it out. But um, Angelina's simulation is extremely general. So when it develops a mechanic, it tries to use it in every way possible. What it noticed was that if it teleported inside a wall, there's a bug in my code that detects when you should be allowed to jump. Um, so if you're standing inside a wall, the code that I wrote says, sure, the player's allowed to jump here. So it jumped out of the wall and then teleported back inside the wall again. And it could do this repeatedly, and it would eventually be able to jump up the side of a wall. So this was a really emergent um, feature that came out of this. And I was really excited to see this because this is something that, as long as Angelina can meaningfully detect it, um, this is the kind of novelty and surprise that we want from um, the system that we're building here, the, the code modification, code generation system. So I didn't have time to go into it in the uh, conference talk, and I won't go into it now because I don't want this video to be too long, but um, we did develop a game called A Puzzling Present using mechanics generated by Mechanic Miner and Angelina, and also levels designed for each mechanic. Um, and this was a way for us to investigate whether these mechanics and levels were any good. So we released it on Android and desktop platforms for free, and we got some lovely press coverage which helped us um, get more players. And inside the game were optional surveys that people could take. Uh, and we, we sort of sensed that this was going to be quite difficult. You can see the survey is very basic, but this was a really tricky um, thing to analyse and a tricky set of questions to ask people. Um, and obviously the problem is that, that difficult for some people is very fun and not difficult for some people it is very fun. And it's quite hard to segment those people or work out whether you should be designing for one or the other or whether there should be a gradient. Um, and these are difficult things, particularly when you consider that um, Mechanic Miner doesn't really know what these mechanics are like. All it can do is tell you if this lets you solve the level. It can't tell you if it's easy to use or fun or difficult. It could be a very fiddly mechanic that a lot of people won't like. Um, and this is a, an area of future work for us, is trying to work out not just if a mechanic is useful, but if it's fun. The remainder of the talk is really about the issues and discussions that came up as a result of this work that were specifically interesting to researchers in computational creativity. So if you're interested in computational creativity stuff, um, keep watching. Um, but most of the game stuff has sort of shifted to one side a little here. So the first issue is this title issue of when nobody's a critic. So when we evaluate creative systems in the past, there's been two major ways of doing it. The first is Ritchie's criteria. So Graham Ritchie proposed a set of criteria for assessing whether something was creative or not. And it looked at the output of that creative system. So it said, well, 
what percentage of its output are going to be considered novel? Or, or even what percentage of its output are going to be considered typical? So in Angelina's case, if Angelina was putting out things and 90% of them didn't look like games at all, then obviously that's not a very good sign. Whereas if 80% of them are novel and surprising and interesting, then that's obviously great. Um, Rich's criteria are quite, quite popular and quite famous. A more newer model, the FACE model, proposed by my supervisor Simon Colton and Alison Pease, um, this doesn't look at the output of a creative system, such as Angelina's games, but it looks at the process that created it. So it looks inside Angelina and asks what kind of tasks Angelina is undergoing in order to create the games that it produces. Um, and both of these approaches are really useful, and various researchers have used them on various different systems in the past. However, there is something that they have in common, which is that they imply that the person evaluating the creative system or the creative output is familiar with the domain that the system is working in. And for Mechanic Miner and Angelina, that domain is not video games, which you might be very familiar with, but it's actually writing code. And although everyone uses software, not everyone knows how to write programs. So this is quite complicating for us, um, because if someone hasn't written a line of code before, can we ask them to evaluate Mechanic Miner's creativity when, in a sense, they're evaluating the creativeness of a piece of code? Um, or is that what we're asking them to evaluate? Are we actually asking them to evaluate how the mechanic appears on screen? What is it that Mechanic Miner is generating? Um, this is a question that we don't know the answer to yet, and it's made us, or it's made me at least, think a lot more about the kind of evaluations that we that we undertake when we try and assess systems like this. The second thing that we talked about, um, I called the Flying Santa anomaly. So the problem here is that many of the mechanics that were produced for um, a puzzling present weren't necessarily sensible for Santa to be doing. Um, and this boils down to code being agnostic to context. So if you look at this piece of code here, this says that if the spacebar is pressed, then for every entity that's in this big list of entities, um, kill it. So this might be like um, the smart bomb in the 1980 game Defender. So when you press a button, everything on the screen is destroyed, every enemy on the screen. And that makes sense for Defender, because it's a game about killing aliens and futuristic space weaponry. Um, and that's absolutely fine to have this piece of code in the game. It makes a bit less sense for a game like Versu, which is about um, social norms in Jane Austen era England. Um, so you're sitting down for a dinner party with a lot of um, high profile social guests. If you pressed a button and everyone's head exploded, this would not make much sense. But the problem is that to a system like Mechanic Miner, it can't tell the difference between those two contexts, because the code doesn't contain information that tells you, oh, by the way, um, you're playing an 18-year-old English woman, or, by the way, you're piloting a futuristic spaceship. So how on earth are we going to overcome this? Well, the short term, we might get away with actually reading the code that we're looking at. Um, and a lot of information is buried in the code that tells you the kinds of concepts that are at play in the um, systems that the player is in, in, engaging with. So if you've got a field called velocity, this might Im imply to you that um, objects are going to be moving around and that that is part of the context of the code. Or we could even have human, human programmers actually annotating these fields and saying this means this, the, the kind of words associated with this um, variable are things like speed and movement. But the problem is we're slipping into the old habits that led us to code generation in the first place, which is that we're relying on humans more, we're relying on pre-annotated databases, um, and this isn't good. This is, this is bad habits slipping back in. Um, this is a video of a game called Lim, um, and this worked well in the presentation, but I won't go into it now. I actually showed people the video without talking to them about what the game was about. Um, and this was a really nice moment because I said, look, context is really important. To show you how important context is, I'm going to show you a video of this game and not tell you what the context of the game is. Um, and we talked about it in the questions afterwards, and I think a lot of people really um, connected with this example. Um, I highly recommend playing Lim and reading about it, but I'm not going to go into it now. Um, it's by someone called Merit Kopas, um, and I can't remember her website, but if you Google it, it will come up. So the third thing, or, or the fourth, the third thing, is that code is everyone's domain, um, and this is particularly applicable for computational creativity researchers. Although not everyone agreed with this point, 
I said most of the people in the room write software, whether they write music generators or generators of soup recipes. And the point is that all of that code can benefit from an approach like Mechanic Miners. You need to look for points where you can pull out a whole section of code, and that code can be executed completely agnostically of what the rest of the program is doing. Um, and then you can let that code vary and change and be modified and perhaps even be completely generated and see how that improves the creativity of your system. And I gave some examples from papers that were presented at the conference, um, such as uh, Tony Veal's Metaphor Generator, which ranked um, metaphors based on their evidence. And I said, well, imagine if that ranking system was actually um, produced automatically. It might produce a ranking that ranked metaphors based on how well they rhymed or how many vowels were used in those words. And some of those rankings may be uninteresting, some of them might be nonsensical. But the, we're getting closer to um, a system that is able to generate part of itself and maybe move towards things like having opinions or aesthetics that it can employ. And this is actually what I came on to next, because when we talk about the really um, juicy concepts in computational creativity, things like independence or an aesthetic or intentionality of a system, those things are not going to come out of abstract grammars and um, plugging together puzzle pieces. They are things that I believe can only come from the code itself, from the lowest level possible, the level that we are working at. Um, and in order for us to, to get our systems to express these things, we need them to start writing code themselves. So, I summarised those three points. Um, we talked about people who are not experts in a domain evaluating a creative action in that domain. We talked about how code doesn't really know what kind of context it's in and how we might overcome that. And I also told everyone that they should get involved in this because it's a lot of fun and that they should try generating code in their own systems. So what's the future for this work particularly? Well, number one um, is to try and work out how we can evaluate code in a way that doesn't just merely say whether it's useful or not. Um, second point is to generate code that's not actually used in a functional way, but maybe an aesthetic way. So a good example would be to generate a shader that's applied to a 3D game. And actually evaluate it not by analysing the code of the shader, but by analysing what the game looks like when that shader is applied to it. So you play the game and take screenshots, and Angelina analyzes those screenshots as it plays the game, and decides whether it likes the shader based on that. And finally, trying to solve this context and code problem to the point where Angelina can enter game jams. Um, every time Ludum Dare passes now, I try and enter myself, and I long for the day that Angelina can enter alongside me. Um, so we're going to be working on this context thing as hard as we can to try and get Angelina in a point where... It could be given a single word, like the Ludum Dare themes, and then hopefully enter um, and produce a game for it. Thanks very much for listening. Um, this is sort of an experimental thing that I did without much preparation. I want to try and get my conference talks online. For people that can't be at the conferences when I give them. Um, if you want to find out more about the project, you can go to gamesbyangelina.org, where I write about my research, other people's research, games that we make, technologies that we're working with. If you want to see a puzzling present that included uh, mechanics generated by Mechanic Miner, you can visit that link there. Um, it's free to download on all operating systems and on Android as well. Um, and it's also open source. It's on GitHub if you want to hack the game itself. Um, and if you want to find out more about our creativity group, um, this is the old website for the creativity group, but hopefully we are all moving to Goldsmith soon and we'll have a new website up there. So. Um, Go to gamesbyangelina.org if you want links to that, because I'll update that site with, with fresh links. Please let me know what you thought about this, or let me know what you think about Angelina in general. I'm MTRC on Twitter, or you can email me, mike at gamesbyangelina.org. I always like talking to people. Thanks very much for watching.